Hello and welcome to today's lecture on puberty and the menstrual cycle. Puberty is a transition from when a person becomes a child to a young adult capable of reproduction. Before there are any outward changes, adrenarchy and gonanarchy occurs. With adrenarchy, there's a regeneration of the zona reticularis in the adrenal glands. This leads to a production of androgens such as DHEA, DHEAS, and androstenedione. Then, with gonadarchy, you get a pulsatile release of GnRH from the hypothalamus. This stimulates the anterior pituitary to release LH and FSH, and this in turn causes the ovaries to produce estrogen. This eventually leads to the development of secondary sex characteristics, typically in the following order. Thelarchy, pubarchy, and menarchy. Thelarchy is the development of breast buds. It typically occurs around age 10 and is due to increased levels of estrogen. Pubarchy is the development of pubic and axillary hair. It typically occurs around age 11, and this is due to the increased levels of androgens. Menarchy is the onset of first menses. It typically occurs around two and a half years after thelarchy. If it does not occur by age 15, or three years after thalarchy. The patient should be evaluated for primary amenorrhea. We'll discuss that in another lecture. Menarche occurs due to increasing levels of estrogen. During puberty, there's also a growth spurt. This increase in growth is due to increased amount of estrogens, which in turn leads to increased levels in growth hormone and somatomedin C. Sometimes puberty may occur earlier than expected in a child. When this happens, we call that precocious puberty. To be specific, the definition of precocious puberty is the onset of secondary sexual characteristics before 8 years old in girls. In boys it's 9, but that's not too important for OBGYN. The reason we chose 8 as the age cutoff for precocious puberty is because this is about 3 standard deviations from the mean age of puberty. Precocious puberty can be divided further into 3 categories. These categories include central, peripheral, and isolated. First, we'll be talking about central, aka gonadotropin-dependent, precocious puberty. This kind of puberty is due to a premature activation of the HPG axis, also known as the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis. Sometimes in females refer to the HPO axis, replacing gonads with ovaries. This leads to a normal sequence of thelarchy, pubarchy, and menarchy, but just at an earlier age. Their sexual characteristics are appropriate for their gender, meaning that although they're developing breasts and pubic hair, you won't see them with a beard. Additionally, these patients have accelerated linear growth for their age, an advanced bone age, high levels of FSH, LH, and estradiol, as is expected for someone who has hit puberty at an earlier age. With central precocious puberty, around 80-90% to of patients have idiopathic causes if they're females. The same percentage does not apply to men. The remaining percentage in females is often due to CNS lesions, such as hypothalamic hamartomas. Now let's talk about peripheral, or gonadotropin-independent precocious puberty. This kind of puberty is due to an excess secretion of sex hormones from sources such as the adrenal glands, ovaries, exogenous sources, or ectopic sources, like gonadotropin from a germ cell tumor. These patients may develop normal secondary sexual characteristics, or they may be abnormal. In particular, you might see some virilization. Some causes include ovarian cysts or tumors, such as the granulosa theca cell tumor, McCune Albright syndrome, primary hypothyroidism, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, or an adrenal tumor. The final kind of precocious puberty is isolated precocious puberty. This includes premature thalarchy and premature adenarchy. With premature thalarchy, you have isolated early breast development. In premature adenarchy, you have isolated early development of male hormone-mediated sexual characteristics, such as pubic and axillary hair or acne. Isolated precocious puberty can just be a variant of normal puberty. However, they should be monitored just in case they develop full-blown precocious puberty. Now let's talk about the management of a patient who comes in with precocious puberty. Let's say if a patient comes in, they're younger than 8 years old, and you see they're developing some secondary sexual characteristics. 
the first thing you want to do is measure their bone age. The way to simply measure bone age is just to take an x-ray of the wrist and compare the age of that bone with the patient's actual age. Say you measure their bone age and you find that the bone age matches the patient's age. That means they have a normal bone age and what they have is isolated precocious puberty. Again, that could be divided into either premature adrenarchy or premature thalarchy. And what you want to do for these patients is simply observe them to see if they develop full-on precocious puberty. Now let's talk about what happens if you measure their bone age and you saw they have an advanced bone age. Now you know they either have a central or peripheral precocious puberty. To differentiate that, you want to measure their LH. The reason we're measuring their LH, if you remember, central precocious puberty is due to a premature activation of the HPG axis. So what we do first is we measure their basal LH. Patients with central precocious puberty will have a high level of basal LH. And if you measure it and you see it's high, you automatically know they have central precocious puberty. Let's say you measure it and they have low LH. You're not too sure yet. What you would do in this scenario is a GnRH stimulation test. The way you do a GnRH stimulation test is you give someone lupulide. If they have central precocious puberty, their HPG axis is already primed and will respond to lupulide by increasing the amount of LH. If you see high LH, again, you know you have central precocious puberty. However, if their LH levels remain low, then you know at this time they have a peripheral precocious puberty. So ultimately, if you find out your patient has central precocious puberty, you want to remember that in girls, about 80 to 90% of them are idiopathic. However, there's still a significant chance that in 20 to 10 percent that the cause of central precocious puberty might be due to a tumor. So what you want to do for any patient with central precocious puberty is get an MRI of the head. If you do see a tumor in the brain, that's easily treated with surgery. However, if you do not see a tumor, that means they have idiopathic or constitutional central precocious puberty. In this case, you don't want the patient to experience puberty early, so you want to delay puberty, and the way to do that is by giving them lupulide. You may be a little confused because earlier I said you give lupulide with a GnRH stimulation test to activate the HPG axis. And over here I'm telling you lupulide will actually turn off the axis. Why is there a difference? The difference is due to the fact over here if you give a short dose in a pulsatile fashion, but over here you're giving a continuous dose of lupulide which will actually turn off the axis. So that's how you treat central precocious puberty. But what do we do if they have peripheral precocious puberty? As your name suggests, they're going to have a peripheral cause, so we're going to look in the periphery for different sources of their precocious puberty. Like I mentioned earlier, some of these causes include ovarian cysts or tumors. So if they have an ovarian cyst or tumor, the way to look for that is with an ultrasound of the abdomen. And if they have a cyst and it's simple, you can leave it. But if they have a complex cyst or tumor, you'll resect it. Another cause is congenital adrenal hyperplasia. The way you diagnose these patients is by doing a urine test to measure the levels of 17-hydroxyprogesterone. If you find these patients to have congenital adrenal hyperplasia, to treat them you simply give them supplements of the steroids they need. Another cause you can look for adrenal tumors. For this you'll just do an ultrasound of the adrenals, and if you see a mass you remove it with surgery. Other tests you should do to help you diagnose a patient with peripheral precocious puberty is to measure their levels of testosterone and DHEAS. That's it for management, now let's move on to the next topic. Now let's talk briefly about the Tanner Scale. The Tanner Scale is used to grade the development of breasts or pubic hair. What you really need to know is that the scale ranges from a level of 1 to 5. A finding of level 1 corresponds to what you'd expect to see in someone who hasn't hit puberty yet. And a finding of level 5 is what you'd expect to see in someone who's completed puberty and has become a full-fledged adult. If you'd like to learn more about each specific level, you could pause the video here and take the time to read them. Now we'll be talking about the menstrual cycle. By this point in your education, you've probably relearned this menstrual cycle about 5 times, but it's always good to get some review. The average length of the menstrual cycle is about 28 days long. And this is what we'll be using for our ideal cycle. On average, when menses does occur, it lasts for 4 days, and about 40 milliliters of blood is lost, and you use about 3 to 6 pads per day. PPD is a good 
acronym to know, and stands for PADS per day. If bleeding occurs for more than 7 days or greater than 80 milliliters is lost, this is called menorrhagia. If bleeding is frequent and irregular, then you have metrorrhagia. If you combine the two and it's prolonged and irregular, you get menometrorrhagia. If cycles last for greater than 35 days, this is considered oligomenorrhea, and if cycles are shorter than 21 days, this is called polymenorrhea. Here we have our graph with all the different levels of hormones and what's going on, and at first it may seem like a lot, but if you take the time to break it down and see why each hormone increases and falls, it's very easy to understand. So our ideal cycle is broken down into two phases. You have the follicular phase, also sometimes known as the proliferative phase, and the luteal phase, also sometimes known as the secretory phase. In this ideal cycle, each phase is exactly two weeks long, or 14 days. The names are very useful in helping you remember what goes on in each phase. In the follicular phase, you have recruitment and development of the follicles, as is seen here, and in the luteal phase, you have your corpus luteum. The first day of our cycle right here is defined by the first day of menses, and it's when you first notice your bleeding. At this point, you have the hypothalamus releasing GRNH in a pulsatile manner. This is stimulating the anterior pituitary to release both LH and FSH. Like the name suggests, FSH, or follicle stimulating hormone, is recruiting and developing the follicles. In any cycle, you'll be recruiting about 5 to 15 primordial ovarian follicles. However, out of those 5 to 15, only one will become the dominant follicle. Now let's talk about what happens on the cellular level. So again, the anterior pituitary is releasing LH. LH acts on theca cells to convert cholesterol to androgens. The androgens are then transferred to the granulosa cell, which is being stimulated by FSH to convert the androgen to estrogen via the help of the enzyme aromatase. An easy way to remember what's stimulating what is in the alphabet, F is right next to G, so you can remember FSH and granulosa cells. Similarly, L is close to T in the alphabet, so you can remember LH stimulates theca cells. Also, it's easy to remember that granulosa cells produce the estrogen by thinking of a very feminine grandma. Once the estrogen is produced, it does a number of things. One of them is it acts via negative inhibition back on the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary. Another thing it does at this time is it causes the endometrium here to proliferate. This creates a hospitable environment for the egg that will soon be released. Granulosa cells also produce inhibin. Inhibin acts via negative inhibition on the anterior pituitary to specifically cause a decrease in FSH. That's why if you look at this chart here and follow the FSH, you initially get a rise, then increase in inhibin causes a little dip at this point. Now let's look at the estrogen. Here the estrogen is represented by yellow. The granulosa cells are producing estrogen, but there's some negative feedback, so you're getting only a slow rise in estrogen. Eventually the estrogen hits a critical level. At this point, estrogen switches from a form of negative feedback to positive feedback, and you get a surge of estrogen. This positive feedback is also affecting the amount of LH release. LH here is represented by blue. It starts off low, and then you get a huge and rapid increase in LH, known as an LH surge. About 24 to 36 hours after the initial LH surge, which is right here, or 12 hours from the LH peak, which is here, you'll eventually get ovulation at this point, represented here in this drawing. So what's happening with ovulation is your dominant follicle releases the oocyte, and what remains of the dominant follicle becomes the corpus luteum. The corpus luteum begins to secrete both estrogen and progesterone. This allows for the maintenance of the endometrium. If the oocyte is fertilized and becomes a gamete, it will begin to secrete HCG, which has a similar structure to LH, and this sustains the corpus luteum. If pregnancy does not occur, the corpus luteum begins to die off, and this causes a decrease in levels of progesterone. Without progesterone to maintain the endometrium, the endometrium will begin to slough off, and you'll begin again here with your menses. The length of the luteal phase is very dependent on how long your corpus luteum lasts over here. Most corpus luteums last about 14 days, 
in most people. Because of this, the luteal phase also lasts 14 days in most people. If a patient has irregular cycles that change in length from cycle to cycle, what's actually changing in length is the follicular phase. This is either getting more or less days. However, the luteal phase is consistently at 14 days. Okay, that's all for today's lecture. Thank you for listening.